All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our case study this month. We're gonna be talking about cyanide poisoning. We're gonna review some cases, how to recognize it, how, what's, what uh, emergencies it causes, and how to treat it. To start with case number one, we have a 35-year-old female who is pulled out of a burning house. You notice that she's got burns to her bilateral arms and legs. She's got soot in her mouth with singed hair and eyebrows. She's moaning and is only responsive to pain. When you get her vital signs, you notice that she's tachycardic at 135. Her blood pressure is 90 over 60. She's breathing about 30 times a minute on her own, and her oxygen saturation is 85% on room air. Is this a case where we'd give cyanokit? Case number two. We have a 45-year-old male pulled from a burning building. He's got an estimated 45 minutes of downtime. We know he's been trapped in there for a significant amount of time. When you pull him out, he's covered in soot. He's got no visible burns, but he's pulseless and apneic. Is this a case where we would give cyanokit? Case number three is a 25-year-old male pulled from a car fire. The only units dispatched to the scene were an engine and a rescue. There's no 7-8 or squad present. There's a suspected suicide attempt. The patient is unresponsive, and his vital signs are a heart rate of 150, a respiratory rate of 30, and an oxygen saturation of 85% on room air. What do you think about cyanokit here? And our last case is a pediatric case with a 13-year-old female pulled from an apartment fire with a GCS of 15 and no visible burns. She's awake and talking, but she's complaining of shortness of breath with some wheezing, and you notice soot in her mouth. Her vital signs are a heart rate of 150, a blood pressure of 106 over 70, with a respiratory rate of 30, and an oxygen saturation of 91% on room air. Is this a case where we would give cyanokit? So whenever I think about cyanide, the biggest thing I want you to take away from this is any enclosed structure fire. There's two big poisons we need to think about. The first one is cyanide. The other one is carbon monoxide. The two go together, and they are deadly poisons. And they are released when there's any combustion of synthetic materials. Of course, there's other sources of cyanide in the environment. Uh, they're frequently found in apricot seeds. Cassava roots frequently a uh, form of food in Africa, and most recently in Venezuela with the downturn of the economy there, they've had an increase in cyanide poisoning as people are turning to this as a source of protein. It's actually a form of pest control used to um, kill rodents and other animals that are not wanted on farmland. And it's found in metal mining as well. One other interesting source of it is some medications we actually give in the hospital to treat blood pressure. If it builds up too much in the system, can cause cyanide toxicity in our patients. I would be a pretty bad doctor if I failed to mention that cigarettes also contain cyanide. So just some food for thought for everybody out there. Another reason why smoking is bad for you. There's a long and sordid history with cyanide poisoning throughout the centuries. So Roman Emperor Nero used it to poison his family. Napoleon used to have his soldiers dip the tips of their spears into cyanide as they approached the enemy in their infantry. Hitler used it in World War II in the gas chambers. And it was actually used in the Jonestown Massacre in the late 1970s um, in Guyana to kill almost 900 people. And I didn't realize this, but I know a lot of us have heard the phrase, drink the Kool-Aid. That's actually where this came from. The cyanide was hidden in the Kool-Aid that all of these people drank, and there was more than 900 people that died. There was an instance in Chicago in the 1980s where some Tylenol bottles were tampered with, and about seven people died from cyanide poisoning in Tylenol. And it was also used most recently in the Iraq War. There's lots of different routes of cyanide exposure. The one we're gonna focus on is inhalation from smoke and burning synthetic materials, but it can also be absorbed through the skin as a powder and ingested in either a liquid or a solid form through food and water. It makes it a perfect bioterror weapon. So how does it work and why is it so deadly? This is where 
you need to brace yourself. We're going to get a little scientific for a minute, but I'm going to try to break it down as easily as I can. When we think about the cells, there's basically three things that they need to survive. There's oxygen, sugar, and ATP. This is what our whole body thrives on and what keeps everything going. Oxygen is delivered by red blood cells. This is basically the transport mechanism for oxygen to get to the cells. And when we think about cells that need a lot of oxygen, the two highest metabolic organs in our body are the heart and the brain. So they have the highest oxygen demand and the highest need for blood flow and constant turnover of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So why is this important? When we think about cells, we're going back to the three things we need, oxygen, glucose, and ATP. So when oxygen comes into the cells by the red blood cell, it delivers sugar into the cell, goes through the mitochondria, and through a series of scientific biochemical reactions is able to produce ATP. And ATP is the structure in the cell that gives the cell energy to do its job. You need oxygen in order to do this. But our bodies are so smart that in the event that there isn't enough oxygen available, they can still function, can still use glucose, can go through an alternative pathway and still make a little bit of ATP, which I think is pretty amazing that we have that backup system in place. The only byproduct of this is going to be lactate. And lactate is an acid um, that can build up a as a byproduct and be a little bit toxic if there's too much of it. Basically, the takeaway is that our cells need ATP to do the energy required to do their job. So if we break it down even farther and we look inside the cell, as glucose comes into the cell and oxygen comes into the cell, they go through a series of biochemical processes and make ATP. As we look a little bit closer, and I promise this is as deep as we're going to get today, Inside the mitochondria, as we're making ATP, there's a very important piece of the puzzle called the electron transport chain. And if you look at this slide, there's basically three integral proteins embedded in the membrane there, and their whole job is to pump those hydrogen ions into the extracellular space. You see all those H's out there? What that does is creates a really positive charge on one side of the membrane. And all the electrical functions in our body have to do with positive and negative charges. So as the transport chain collects hydrogen ions and pumps them out into the inner membrane space, they collect out there and can go through the ATP pump, use that positive energy to fuel the, to fuel the pump and create ATP. So why do you care? Well, when we think about hydrogen cyanide, this is what it looks like, and it's a super negatively charged ion. And where it acts is right in the middle of the electron transport chain. So if you look at what it does, it blocks the cell's ability to pump any hydrogen ions into the extracellular space, and therefore stops the ability to make any ATP. So you don't get any hydrogen ions out there, which means you're not building up a positive electrical gradient, which means that the cell isn't able to make the ATP that it's supposed to. And now the cell has no energy to do its job. So basically what it does is forces the cell to go down the alternative pathway, and instead of suffocating, it's going to do its best to work in an anaerobic environment, and it makes a lot of lactate. And lactate is actually the thing that we measure when these patients get to the hospital to indicate that there's something wrong at the cellular level with the cell's ability to use oxygen. And the tissues where we're going to see this clinically earliest are going to be the brain and the heart. They're affected the most because they're the most metabolically active and they have the highest oxygen demand. So if you think about your patient that you're pulling from a fire, the early signs and symptoms that you're going to see are headache, agitation, anxiety, as the brain is not getting enough oxygen. There might be dizziness, there might be confusion, and as the heart is not getting enough oxygen either, you're going to see a fast heart rate, fast breathing, shortness of breath, 
all things indicating that the heart and the brain are having to work extra hard to overcome the lack of oxygen. So early on in an exposure, what you're going to see is that everything speeds up. But as the cyanide builds up over time, the late signs and symptoms that you're going to see are going to be worsening mental status, maybe seizures, maybe coma. And in terms of the heart and the lungs, there's going to be bradycardia, hypotension, and possibly cardiac arrest as the, as the body's just not able to keep up with the metabolic demand. Things are going to slow down, and then people die. Usually with cyanide, death is going to occur anywhere six to eight minutes following an inhalation exposure. So how do we treat cyanide poisoning? Well, the treatment that we have in our system is the cyano kit. And here's a little explanation of how it works. If you take hydrogen cyanide, which is the poison, and then we give them the antidote, which is hydroxocobalamin, the two are going to work together. So if you watch the poison and the antidote, the hydrogen from the hydrogen cyanide and the hydrogen from the hydroxocobalamin are going to go off together and form water. And then you're left with a very, pos very positive cobalamin molecule and a very negative cyanide molecule. And the positive and the negative are attracted together, and they go off and make cyanocobalamin, which, interestingly, is also known as B12. B12 is something that's really easily processed by our kidneys. It's something we get in our diet all the time, and our body knows exactly how to metabolize it and what to do with it. So by giving the antidote, we've taken a poison, we've combined it with something our body is used to, and we have a normal way to excrete it. So when you see the cyano kit, this is what it's going to look like. Each kit is going to contain the actual um, hydroxocobalamin in a, in a glass jar. There's going to be an insert with how to use it, a quick reference guide, a transfer spike, and an infusion set. The important thing to notice here is that there, the powder, there's going to be a powder in the glass vial, and that's going to need to be reconstituted. And there's no diluent that's included in the kit, so you're going to need uh, a pre-filled bag, and we'll talk about that. So when we are talking about the diluent, you can use sodium chloride, but it's also okay to use lactated ringers or D5. Whatever you have, it just takes about 200 mils of it. When we do administer this, it's good to know that there are some side effects that we anticipate. A lot of times patients' skin will turn bright red, and it will turn body fluids red as well. So you might see red tears, red saliva, even red urine. Um, that's anticipated and expected. Don't feel like you did anything wrong if you start to see that when you're transporting. The other thing that is known to happen is that hypertension might occur. And that's actually OK, because usually if we're giving this to patients, they're going to be hypotensive. And this might help stabilize their vital signs a little bit. So in our system, we only have cyano kits on the 7-8 truck and on the squads. The 7-8 usually carries two kits, and I think each squad has one kit. And how we put it together, first you're going to spike the bag with the transfer spike, whatever fluid you're using. I think we'll probably use normal saline. And then you use the other end of the spike to put the fluid into the powdered vial. You're going to squeeze 200 cc's of fluid in until you see the fill line. And you're not going to shake it. You just need to invert it a couple times until you see that all the powder is consumed and diluted into the, into the fluid. And then you're basically ready to administer it. You spike the cyano kit. You can hang it from the IV pole. And it does need a dedicated line. It's OK to give it via IO or IV. And the dose that we're going to give for an adult is 5 grams over 15 minutes. And that's about 3 drops a second or 200 drops a minute. And one vial is a complete dose for an adult. Pediatric doses, there's going to be a cheat sheet taped to the side of the cyano kit that you get from the 7-8 or the squad. But the dose you need to know is 70 milligrams per kilogram given over 15 minutes. 
It's important to remember that as long as we're treating and thinking about cyanide toxicity, don't forget that these patients have probably also been exposed to carbon monoxide as well. The only treatment that we have for that in the field is going to be high flow O2. So even though you're treating the anaerobic metabolism with the cyano kit, remember to put a non rebreather on there with high flow O2 to treat the carbon suspected carbon monoxide toxicity as well. So if we go back to our cases that we had at the beginning, case number one is the 35-year-old female who was burnt, uh, pulled from the burning house. She's tachycardic, she's hypotensive, she's tachypnic, and she's hypoxic. Are we going to give the cyano kit here? I'd say absolutely yes. This is the perfect person who we're looking for to give cyano kit to. Case number two, though, 45-year-old male pulled from a burning building, really prolonged downtime, long extrication, pulseless and apneic when you pull him out. This is probably someone um, who is way past their six to eight minute mark of the um, cyanide toxicity, and it's probably not going to work here. And I would actually say I would not give it in this situation. Case number three with the car fire. Sounds like the perfect situation. He's pulled from a burning fire. There's definitely burning synthetic materials there. His vital signs would indicate that he needs it. But the problem is, on this case, we don't have the squad or the 7-8 there who actually have the cyano kit. So the question would be, how close is the cyano kit versus how close is the hospital? And whichever way is the fastest way to get him to the antidote would be better. So depending where you are in the city, and how close your nearest resources um, for the cyano kit would be would depend on your treatment here. So I would call this a maybe. And then case number four with the with the pediatric um, patient who was pulled from an apartment fire. Also fairly stable vitals, but she's wheezing and has soot in her mouth, and it's the right setting where there is likely an inhalation injury. I would go ahead and administer that to her. Really, the bottom line for all of this is that the cyano kit should be administered to anyone who's removed from an enclosed structure fire that has any sort of abnormal vital signs or altered mental status. There's really no downside to giving it, and it could possibly save a life. If there's any questions, please feel free to contact me or the 7-8.